soon. The first thing that I would like to discuss, guys, is that um, today we will visit many topics, okay? Because we are bringing uh, um, two perspectives that they are really um, historically and culturally different, but somehow they merge, yes? But to understand how they merge, we need to pass through many different topics. Each topic that we will discuss today um, can be a university, can be a career, because we will talk about biology, psychology, uh, evolutionary psychology. So there will be many topics that uh, we won't be able to go into much depth so that we can cover a, a larger terrain, okay? But um, if you feel curious to know more about the topics that we will visit, uh, feel free to search more about that. You will have at least some introduction to many different aspects, okay? This is the first um, notice that I would like to present. The second one is about the title, Buddhism and Modern Psychology, because uh, what does it mean, this, uh, two, uh, this headline that we have? Concerning the first one, Buddhism, we should say that we will today um, put aside all the metaphysical aspects of Buddhism. So we will not be talking about religion, we will not be talking about gods, spirit, soul. We will be talking uh, what we could call a secular Buddhism a Buddhism that is more of a philosophy of life, a philosophy of having a good uh, and peaceful life, uh, increasing our well-being, increasing um, the way that we treat people, the way that our mind works, and also developing some wisdom about life. Yeah, so we will uh, put aside, because it is not our objective, the religious aspect. And we will talk about this secular Buddhism, yeah? And then, go there, Diego, please, go there. And a modern psychology, guys, other thing that needs um, a little explanation. Modern psychology is connected with the psychology from the second half of the 20th century, Yes. So a little context uh, on this. It is important for us to start introducing Freud, Sigmund Freud. Freud uh, was important to begin, in a way, this modern movement of psychology because he uh, identified that a considerable, par a considerable portion of our behavior comes from unconscious uh, reasons. It comes from unconscious movements, yes? So there are things that are um, below our conscious mind that they influence profoundly our behavior, okay? So it's very important to keep this idea um, in your head while we progress through this webinar. That the thing that we call the self, the um, I am, I like, I decided, sometimes is, is a little bit overestimated that many of our comportments, thoughts, emotions, and decisions, they happen uh, behind the curtains without us being completely aware. Freud was very skeptical about uh, the I, the self, but as we will see today, uh, very likely Freud was not skeptical enough about this. So um, it means that what we understand today, um, we agree in part with Freud, but as we see, his theory uh, was not complex enough to understand the human mind. And then, guys, after Freud, we had different schools of thought. We had uh, behaviorism that um, described that we are a blank slate. Okay, this is something very important. 
when we talk about what constitutes a person, yeah, many people say we are socially created, we are culturally created, our society creates us. Uh, what people want to say when they describe this is that we are conditioned by our environment. Yes. And this is what behaviorism believes, that um, I can take any individual and I can transform this individual in anything, given the necessary stimulus. Yes. Are you familiar, guys, with... Um, Pavlov and Pavlovian dogs. Are you familiar with this theory, with this experiment? Who is familiar? Raise the hand, please. Pavlov. Elisa. So that's the, the other alpinists. They don't get tired of my voice. <laughs> Can you explain for us what uh, Pavlov did with the dogs? I remember a little about the, his experience. Um, it's about having a dog and using a noise or an alarm to when he released food, I guess, to train the dog. So the dog was con conditioned to, to understand that the noise meant that behavior. Something like that? Yeah, so yeah, it's, it's, it's in, this, in, this, in this direction. Um, but this is it, guys. It is um, Pavlov took some dogs and then he presented food. And when the dogs see the food, they salivate. Yeah. And um, then, okay, this is a natural behavior. And what he started doing was he started, when he presented the food to the dogs, he started ringing a bell, yes, and then the dogs assimilated that when they saw food, a bell would ring, and then they would salivate. After some rounds of conditioning, Pavlov removed the food, and then he just simply rang the bell, and then the dogs would salivate without the presence of food. Yes, so Pav Pavlov conditioned a behavior that was not natural. So he changed the animal's comportment. Okay, and then we have what this theory says, that everything is about reward and punishment. We can take a person and with reward and punishment, uh, recompensa and punição, we can transform this person in whatever we want, in whatever we decide. So this uh, is a little bit about behaviorism, okay? But then, guys, uh, now we get to modern psychology. But then we can say that things start to get a little bit more confusing and a little bit crazier um, after a while. Because um, there was a moment, now I will be very, uh, I will try not to be too technical, okay? So if you have some questions along the way, ask me, because it's a very important reflection to make. The thing is, guys, um, in, in patients that had seizures, Seizures, they are uh, an attack, uncontrollable attack that some people have that they start shaking. Yes, uh, this um, seizure uh, that generated convulsion is something that people that suffered that didn't want. And then um, surgeons decided to cut a connection between the two hemispheres of the brain. Because in our brain, there are two hemispheres. That is the left hemisphere and that is the right hemisphere. And connecting these two hemispheres, that is what we call corpus callosum. Okay, that it is a combination of fibers. Okay, guys, so far so good? 
Yes, so there are two hemispheres in the brain, and then in the middle of these um, brains, there is this uh, of these hemispheres, there is the corpus callosum. And then to avoid that this convulsion and the seizure spread to the complete uh, to the complete brain, surgeons decided to cut this corpus callosum, and they uh, disconnected the two hemisphere. For people that live in Floripa, they destroyed Ercilio Luz. Okay, so, uh, so there was no way to uh, cross the continent to the island. And then we think, wow, uh, this must be something very important. Let's see what happens with these people. And then some studies started to happen. And then we started identifying, once you cut uh, the corpus callosum, guys, the left hemisphere and the right hemisphere, they are separated. And you know that uh, the right hemisphere controls the left part of the body. Okay? So, uh, there is a transversality in your brain. The right hemisphere controls the left part, the left eye, the left hand, yes? And then the left hemisphere controls the right part, the right eye, the right leg, the right arm. So there is this transversality in your brain. And then what happens was uh, people shown a word, for example, car, in to the um, left eye without the right eye seeing that. So they would see this, uh, this car, and then the, uh, the right hemisphere would interpret this information. Okay. Uh, language, now we return to Freud. Okay. Language is connected with the left hemisphere. What we call the eye, the self, the me is located in the left hemisphere. Yes, language. So the, P, uh, the person would see the word car, and then when the scientists asked this person, what word did you see? The people would say, I didn't see any word. So the person didn't receive uh, linguistically this information. But then the scientists would give a box to this person to select some objects. And then um, um, the part of the brain, the left hand of this person, the scientist would say, take an object. The person would take a little car. So what does this mean? That there is a part of the brain of the person that received the information and the person was not completely conscious about that. And this influenced the comportment of the person. So this returns to what Freud mentioned, that there is parts of our behavior that they are below the conscious surface. Okay? And now, guys, we will start understanding why this happens. Okay? So now we will begin our webinar. We will understand why this happens and what Buddhism says about this, what Buddhism talks about that. Okay, so this was the introduction. Let's move on. Buddhism and modern psychology, ethics, concentration, and wisdom. Part one, origins, part two, humans, and part three, antidote. Artus, Leo, Danilo, and Mari, welcome, guys. How are you feeling? Are you feeling fine? Good? Give me a thumbs up. Leo and Mari, can we see you? Leo is there. Mari, too. Excellent. Good, Mari. Excellent. So then, guys, let's begin. Amazing. Let's, let's start... <laughs> with a matrix reference. Elisa, can you read for us, please? This is your last chance. After this, there is no turning back. 
you take the blue pill, the story ends. You wake up in your bed and believe whatever you want to believe. You take the red pill, you stay in Wonderland. And I show you how deep the rabbit hole goes. Remember, all I'm offering is the truth. Nothing more. More feels to you. Excellent, guys. So now is the moment. Okay. You can decide. You, um, you see here, um, you take the blue pill and then you, you believe whatever you want to believe. You live in a fake world. Yeah. So if you want to take the blue pill, it's the time to leave the webinar. Okay. But if you want to take the red pill, it is the time to break the innocence. It's the time to become a little bit more skeptical about human nature and to see that we are not so much in control as we believe we are. But there is a possible solution to this. So let me ask you, anyone here wants to take the blue pill and live in a fake reality? If you do, please raise your hand. I see. And anyone here would like to take the red pill and then see reality in its crudest, in its most profound way? Raise your hand. Artus. <laughs> Mari raised the hand. Artus, he didn't raise the hand yet, but okay. <laughs> Can I take half? Take can I take half? <laughs> red and blue. <laughs> I didn't think about this possibility, Artus. <laughs> but perhaps. But I, I believe no, man. I believe no. It is one or another. Yeah. The, can we go with the red pill? Fantastic. Then, guys, let us begin. <laughs> Beautiful. The first part, guys, is origins. So this talks about where we came from. The Bible says, no, no, you know that that will not be the thing. Very cool. Um, guys, um, initially, there is this question, where do we come from? Where, why are we here? Can we be happy and why do people suffer? Where do we come from, Eduardo? Uh, the Big Bang. <laughs> That's when it started. <laughs> and how the Big Bang led to us, Edu? Of course, you do not need to develop a very um, complete exp um, explanation, but some important points. So, I guess the planets were formed, the galaxies, and then the microorganisms in, in the beginnings of the Earth. And now we are here. <laughs> no, no, no. This is it. This is it. <laughs> Why are we here? Danilo. All right. I think... Um, why are we here? Is there, do you think, Danilo, that there is a bigger purpose and we are part of a cosmological, a universal order where every one of us has a mission that should conduce our lives? Or do you think that um, everyone is... Uh, doing the best we can and everyone um, is uh, will create its own mission i guess something like this and what do you think is your mission danilo 
My mission. Oh my god. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you decided to take the red pill. So <laughs> All right, I, I, I think um, um, make uh, good things, um, help the environment, help the people, help the world. Excellent. Tell, good evening. Can we be happy? It depends on what happiness mean to the the being. You know? <laughs> but I think that we can be happy unless we pursue something that isn't the true happiness for ourselves. I may. I will repeat this, guys. We can be happy unless we pursue things that are not true to the individual. And you will see that Buddhism wants to touch exactly on this point, that we can be truly satisfied, we can, be, uh, we can achieve enlightenment, which is very hard, I must tell you. But uh, perhaps we do not need to achieve enlightenment and be as spiritual as Buddha, but we can increase the quality of our lives. And this is the most important aspect, I would say, of the Buddhist teachings for us. How we can lead a life that is that can provide us with some sort of satisfaction. And why do people suffer? Wow, that's a tough one. Diego, why do people suffer? Uh, because people aren't happy. And why is that? Uh, people suffer because uh other people uh, don't pursue the happiness like or don't don't pursue the truth through the truth interesting so I can infer that you say that people are that people suffer because they pursue wrong things yes mm, interesting and what would be these wrong things? Uh, like, for example, if a person commits a crime, another person will suffer because of this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And now, guys, very quick exercise. Very, very, very quick. Write on the shot three things that you think make people suffer. You don't need to elaborate like a paragraph. Just bullet list. Three things right there that you believe make people suffer. Pain, loss, fear, mm -hmm. sickness, loneliness, frustration. <laughs> Love. <laughs> Lies. Self-expectations not achieved, external imposed expectation, sickness. Poverty.
10 seconds. Egoism, capitalism, politicians. <laughs> A lot of ambition. Excellent. Fantastic, guys. So then we have this brainstorm here. Let's see what Buddha and what our, uh, uh, our psyche would, will tell us about that. Let us begin. Fantastic, guys. The first question is, uh, the first topic that we'll discuss is connected with natural selection. Natalia, can you read for us? Yes. Natural selection is the process through which populations of living organism, organisms adapt and change. Individuals in a population are naturally variable, meaning that they are all different in some way. This variation means that some individuals have traits better suited to the environment than others. Individuals with adapt adaptive traits, traits that give them some advantage, are more likely to survive and reproduce. These individuals then pass the adap adaptive trait on the day of spring. Over time, these advantageous traits become more common in the population. Through this process of natural selection, favorable traits are transmitted through generations. Excellent, guys. So then we get to natural selection, the process that formed us and it formed uh, our psyche, it formed our biological apparatus. Uh, what is fundamental about that is um, some individuals they have some genetic traits that can give some advantage on that specific environment. Because there is always a relationship between animal, organism, and the environment, right? So the organism needs to uh, be well adapted to the environment in order to get food, in order to escape predators, and in order to reproduce. Therefore, animals, um, individuals that have this genetic mutation that gives this advantage, has a competitive advantage that in, um, it will pass for the next generation, and then the um, offspring, the, the children of this genetic advantage will pass the um, trait for the other generation. Very soon, uh, a whole population will have that genetic trait because the less disadvantageous ones, they were eliminated because of this, okay? So natural selection produces a lot of... Uh, produces, generates a lot of um, genetic mutations. Some are advantageous, some are not. The ones that are advantageous, they have uh, more probability to survive and reproduce, yes? But meanwhile, a lot of animals, they are discontinued, they are eliminated from the manufacturing production, yes? We can see the example of Homo sapiens, yes? The man that knows, the species that knows. When Homo sapiens got on, on this version, on this software version, uh, there were different humans. There was Neanderthals, there was different Homos, but then Homo sapiens was so intelligent and had such an adventurous capacity that we colonized the planet and we fundamentally killed all the other species of Homo. Yes. 
And um, not only homo, but when we get to an environment, and I'm not saying that people are bad, okay, but this is not the objective. The objective is to say when we get in an environment, very soon the big mammals in that region, they die because we hunt them. And uh, the good and the bad thing at the same moment is that we are incredibly efficient in doing that. Okay, so we are the result of this process, yeah? We are, in a way, the, um, we, um, we are the process becoming aware of the process, yes? So we are a result of natural selection, and for the first time, an animal can understand what generated it, in this case, us. Okay, let's move on. That is a video, a pedagogical video. Guys, suggestion, have a notebook with you uh, so that you can take notes, yes? Have some piece of paper there because we will see a little bit about the, the theory of evolution. The belief that God had created mankind... I will expand it. his own image and likeness was shared by most Western scientists until the middle of the 19th century. They thought all the creatures of the planet had been conceived by a divine force. That is, until Charles Darwin arrived. Some researchers were already talking about an evolution of the species, but the British naturalist was the first to explain with evidence how evolution might occur by natural selection. His theory radically changed biology, offering a new explanation of the origin of human beings. It also made him one of the most influential scientists and intellectuals in history. But to get there, he had to make an extraordinary journey, perform hundreds of experiments and spend 20 years refining his ideas. In 1831, Darwin was 22 years old and studying at the University of Cambridge when he was invited as a naturalist to a great expedition. He boarded the HMS Beagle and spent almost five years traveling several continents, starting in South America, from which he brought back dozens of life specimens, illustrations and fossils. These fossils gave him one of the first clues about evolution. For example, observing the remains of a mylodon, a giant animal similar to the sloth, he thought that those similarities were probably not a coincidence. There had to be some kind of link. When he stopped at the Galapagos Islands, Darwin also observed its giant tortoises, which lived in nearby islands that showed unique physical characteristics in each island. In the humid areas where vegetation was abundant, the turtles had a short neck and a dome-shaped shell. Whilst in the islands with a drier environment, they had a saddle-like shell and a longer neck. But could he explain that difference? Upon his return, Darwin spent time observing how animal breeders and gardeners crossbred animals of a species to create new varieties. For that creation to be successful, the artificial selection made by man was key. Darwin realized that the natural world probably made the same kind of selection, but he couldn't explain how it happened. Until he read the work of Thomas Robert Malthus, a British intellectual from the 18th century. In an essay on demography, Malthus said that as the population in Europe was growing, at one point it would increase much more than the food supplies available, and that would cause a fight for survival. This idea helped Darwin explain how evolution works. In nature, there is a struggle for survival, in which the strongest individual is not necessarily the survivor. Instead, it's the one which best adapts to the environment where it lives. If a living being has any trait that helps him to survive, it will be more successful at reproduction. Those which don't adapt will die without descendants. The creatures with the most success in reproducing pass their traits to their lineage, and so on, until these variations end up becoming a new species. That's why the differences between the Galapagos tortoises were a product of evolution. In a drier environment, those with longer necks could reach the bushes easily in order to get food, whilst those who lived in the humid environment could eat grass and protect themselves from predators, thanks to their shorter neck and the dome-shaped shell. 
Darwin said that all species, including humans, were not created independently, but they descended from a common ancestor. From then on, life on the planet began to diversify. 20 years after his trip, Darwin had written thousands of pages, but he hadn't published any. He wanted to have irrefutable evidence, perhaps because he knew that his theory was going to cause quite a stir. But everything changed when he received a letter from Alfred Russell Wallace, an admirer and fellow naturalist who told him that he had reached the same conclusion. Evolution was produced by natural selection. Darwin panicked, facing the possibility that Wallace could take sole credit for the theory. So the two naturalists agreed to present a joint letter explaining their findings. But a year later, Darwin published his book titled On the Origin of Species, and he became a celebrity way beyond the scientific community. His findings shook the foundations of Victorian Britain. Like Copernicus in his time, Darwin changed the game by explaining that diversity came from a biological process without any interference from God. Darwin put human beings on the same evolutionary level as all the creatures on the planet. Scientific advances have confirmed his theory, and even the Catholic Church ended up accepting, decades later, that evolution is compatible with faith. And today, more than 150 years after Darwin's theory became known, we know that evolution is a fact. The planet keeps changing, sometimes dramatically, and we keep changing with it. Wow, that was something, wasn't it? Um, so you see, guys, um, um, theory of evolution talks about these genetic mutations that give some advantage to some organisms that have it. And the ones that cannot adapt so well to the environment die. So it is a very ruthless process. Yes, it's a process that demands a little bit of a paranoic animal to survive it. And here we are. Now, let's move on. <laughs> Interesting. Now, guys, we start to understand a little bit about uh, pleasure and um, uh, how, what are the instruments that natural selection uses so that it motivates the animals to survive. Yes, and how that influences profoundly the comportment. Artus, please, can you read for us? Three principles. For animals pass their genes to the next generation. First, animals should have some goals, and when they reach these goals, they should obtain pleasure. Second, pleasure should be temporary. Third, animals should be addicted to pleasure without identifying that it is temporary. Excellent. So let me explain a little bit about what it is saying here. Um, let me ask Mari. Mari, is it delicious to eat uh, McDonald's? Uh, no, I don't like. <laughs> I don't eat uh, meat anymore, for example. Excellent. Uh, what do you like to eat? Uh, I like to eat uh, a pizza, a mozzarella pizza. A mozzarella pizza, interesting. So fat from the cheese. Do you like sweet things? Yes. Yeah, do you like ice cream? Do you like... Um... Ice cream, uh, the... Macaloso is a, is a good... It's a good one. Excellent, excellent. And then, guys, we should think, why do we like sugar, for example? Why do we like fat? Because this gives us pleasure, right? It is pleasurable to eat a bar of chocolate. But then we should think, okay, what exactly is the function of pleasure? 
why are we attracted to some things and, uh, and why we are repulsed by others. We are repulsed by some things and some things we really have the necessity, like a chocolate or pizza. So sensual pleasure, yes. And then pleasure, guys, is the mechanism that natural selection gives to the organisms to survive and reproduce. Because in the environment that we developed, sweet things, they were fruits, not ice cream or, uh, or chocolate. They were fruits and fruits are good for us. So animals that developed a sweet tooth developed a taste for sh uh, for sweet things usually they had a better nutrition than the ones that didn't therefore they would survive so you see guys that pleasure is not something that we decide it is a mechanism that natural selection creates in us so that we uh, uh, that we become attracted to things that will uh, ensure that our genetic characteristics are passed to the other generation and that we are repulsed by things that can eliminate the chance of passing our genetic characteristics to the next generation. Therefore, guys, the objective of natural selection is not, it, it is not that we are happy. It is that we pass our genes to the next generation okay so that's why we feel pleasure on some things and we feel repulsed by other other thing that it is important um for example a cell phone uh, or a computer let me ask to leo leo uh, recently, did you buy a computer or a cell phone or a car? Did you buy something big recently? Um, no, I I am to save money uh, to future <laughs> in the moment. Excellent, excellent. And uh, your graduation, Leo, you, uh, when you concluded your graduation, did you feel a profound sense of satisfaction or when you concluded your graduation you were looking for the next objective i am looking objective objective exactly so we see guys that when we conclude something once we obtain something normally the pleasure the satisfaction that we think we will feel disappears and then we are looking to the next thing i asked leo about the cell phone or the house or the car because imagine a car we see a car that's very beautiful oh, i want to buy that car artus right and then we, we want to i want to buy the car and then when we buy the car oh, it's uh, it's good it's a nice car but it's not so nice I think I would like the next version. And then we think, why do we think this way? Because, guys, it is not simply consumerism that generates this comportment. It is the nature of pleasure that it is temporary. Okay, so pleasure needs to be temporary. Because let's look to the logic of natural selection. Yes, so natural selection gives us pleasure so that we increase our chance of reproduction for the next generation. So far, so good. Nice. But then imagine that if this animal, ah, the animal ate a fruit, now this animal became Buddha. This animal will be eaten by other animal, and this animal will not uh, be, uh, will not feel the necessity to have other objectives. So natural selection makes pleasure important for us. It's something that we pay attention. 
and it's something that it is temporary because once we achieve that we need to go to the next thing so that we increase the probability of passing our genes to the next generation you see that guys so it is the logic natural selection makes pleasure important but then this pleasure should be temporary because if it is continuous if it is eternal the animal will not reproduce the animal will be enlightened and will be satisfied yeah so pleasure needs to be temporary okay we are talking guys about uh, genetic characteristics but then we should understand now what is a gene okay guys what is a gene and why is this so um important on this reflection we will watch a video and then take notes about that as well even clearly presents what exactly is a gene each one of our cells contains 46 strands of DNA. A single strand is made of millions of particles called nucleotides, and these nucleotides come in four different types, which scientists have labeled A, C, T, and G. A gene is a special stretch of DNA, a sequence of A's, C's, T's, and G's that code for something. A gene contains information for a cell to read and use, but what exactly does that information do? You might have heard that there's a blue-eyed gene, a freckle gene, possibly even an anger gene, but single genes don't literally make things like eyeballs or freckles or temper tantrums. Genes make proteins. Those proteins then interact with each other and all sorts of chemicals inside the body to build things like eye pigments, freckles, and mood-altering hormones. A single strand of DNA contains thousands of genes or unique protein recipes. Humans have roughly 20,000 altogether. Some genes are small, only about 300 letters long. Others are well over a million. The length and sequence of a gene determine the size and shape of the protein it builds. The size and shape of the protein determine the function that protein will have inside the body. Hemoglobin, for example, is a protein structure found in red blood cells. Its unique shape and size allow it to capture oxygen molecules when blood flows near the lungs, and then release them later when blood flows near oxygen-starved tissues. Pepsin is a digestive protein. Its unique shape allows it to break down food inside your stomach so it can be absorbed by the body. Keratin is a structural protein. Its unique shape and size allow it to link together with other keratin proteins to form hard structures like fingernails, claws, and beaks. Different creatures have different genes, which is ultimately why their bodies look and function differently. But one of the many reasons scientists believe all life on Earth is related is that the basic DNA code, the language of A's, C's, T's, and G's, is pretty much the same for all living things. Many creatures even share some of the same genes. You might not be too surprised to learn that humans and chimps, which are closely related, share 96% of their genetic code. But what would you think a lowly fruit fly has in common with a beautiful swimsuit model? Surprisingly, about half of its genes. Because all creatures use DNA in pretty much the same way, genetic engineers have found that if they take a gene from, say, a bacteria cell and insert it into the DNA of an animal or a plant cell, that animal or plant cell will then read the new gene and produce the bacterial protein. Engineers have mixed and matched the genes of different organisms to produce many new creatures, including corn that is toxic to insects but supposedly safe for human consumption, tomatoes that last up to twice as long in the grocery store before going bad, and a new form of bacteria that produced the human protein insulin, which we then collect from these bacteria and give to people with diabetes who need extra insulin to survive. So just to sum things up a bit, what exactly is a gene? 
a gene is a special stretch of DNA, not the entire strand of DNA, just a segment that codes for something. Each gene is like a unique recipe, which usually tells a cell how to make a protein or a group of proteins. Different creatures have different genes, but all genes are written in the same basic DNA language of A's, C's, T's, and G's. I'm John Perry, and that's genes stated clearly. Okay, guys. So to summarize, genes, they are instructions uh, that our body has in order to construct proteins. Danilo, uh, you will be the, the most um, educated, the most instructed to answer that. But not all genes produce proteins, yeah? Yes. And, and so genes, they produce proteins. And is there other thing that they produce besides proteins? Is there other substance that they produce or no? In general, in general, produce uh, protein, proteins, uh, proteins, uh, um, with a specific uh, function. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Excellent. So you see, guys, that genes, they are these instructions. And what they want is to go to the next generation. This is their objective. They want to be alive. They want to continue alive. And your genes, they shape and they influence your behavior. It's curious to identify that um, monkeys and humans, uh, chimpanzees, the, the ones that they mentioned, they share 96% of the DNA code. So that is 4% that makes us different and uh, hugely different from our close relatives. By the way, guys, uh, uh, do you know when um, the primates, when chimpanzees, gorillas, the other primates and us shared a common ancestor, do you know how many years ago we diverged from other primates in the evolutionary tree. How many yeah. years ago? 15? No. <laughs> long, long time ago. If you could guess how many years, put on the shot, how many years you think this, th that we diverged from our cousins, primates? Oh my gosh. Put in the shot. How many years you think? You cannot Google. That's not fair. You cannot Google it. Give an educated guess. <laughs> Edu got excited there. <laughs> Come on, guys, don't be afraid. Send your, your guess. I, I must say that is a lot more than 20,000. 20,000, 100,000 more. Uh huh. Everybody has sent? S send your guess there, guys. I am like the bingo man. Yeah. <laughs> Number 28. Anyone? 28. These guys, 100,000 of years ago, actually, actually, we diverged from our cousins 8 million years ago. Because you see, guys, what happened? We diverged from the primates, our, from our, our cousins, 8 million years ago. And then from these 8 million years ago, we had Australopithecus, 
we had uh, wow they, they, there are so many names but let's take a look there let me see if I can open here the species before can we find some names So you see these guys, these, um, once we abandoned there, uh, the Diopithecus, our most distant ancestor of hominids, this was the beginning, this was not an uh, ancestor of the gorillas and the chimpanzees any longer, this was uh, our ancestor, and then we, we had the Siva Pithecus, the Australopithecus, and then six million years ago, considered the first hominid. This is not a uh, primate as we consider any longer. And then we had the Homo habilis, that it was around two and a half million years ago. This was the moment, uh, and then Homo erectus, the one that carved stone and controlled fire. No gorilla, no chimpanzee can create tools and control fire, but our very, very distant ancestors did. And then you see that these ancestors, they generated what would become uh, the Homo sapiens neanderthalis um, and then the Homo sapiens sapiens. That is um, an idea, guys, that the modern human being, uh, the, the modern human being equal to us, it was present around in the east part of Africa. So if we take a look on Africa, our ancestors came from this region here, from Ethiopia, Kenya, South Sudan, this east part of um, Africa, and then the Homo sapiens, that they could use language, they could use tools. The modern person, what they did not have was civilization, but they had the cognitive apparatus that every one of us have around 100,000 to 200,000 years ago. Yeah. And then if we put things in perspective, writing began 6,000 years ago. Egypt was about 4,000 years ago, the old Egypt in its majestic influence. Jesus Christ, 2,000 years ago. And then we had Industrial Revolution, 200 years ago. And uh, Internet was developed 50 years ago, 70 years ago. So you see that the, uh, now we are not having biological revolutions. We are having cultural revolutions. All right. So now you know that we abandon our distant, uh, the other primates around eight to seven year, uh, million years ago. There is a documentary, guys, that I would like to recommend you. That is called Becoming Human. This is a... Um, a documentary that you can find on YouTube. It is composed of three episodes. Um, if I were you, I would take this suggestion on the notebook so that you can even practice your English. Becoming human. I will send you the link. There are three episodes. Very, very, very interesting. Okay, let's continue because we have a lot of things to discuss. We are in the part one <laughs> yet. Evolutionary psychology. Artus, can you read for us? You read the last one, Artus. Again, Matheus, yeah. No, 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 no. Not you. Let me see. Uh, Mari, please. Evolutionary psychology. Uh, evolutionary psychology is not a distinctive branch of psychology, but rather a theo theoretical lens that is currently informing all branches of psychology. It is based on a series of logically consistent and well-confirmed premises. One, uh, evolutionary pro 
process have sculpted body and brain, mind, behavior, and psychology psychological mechanism, Mari? emotions, Mari? and thoughts. Psychological. Psychological mechanisms, emotions, and thoughts. These mechanisms are results to adaptation in the environment, result in survival and reproduction. Three. These mechanisms are not optimal to a modern society since they were created in a very different environment. Excellent. So then, guys, now we start getting to humans. Now we start getting to the second part of our webinar. Evolutionary psychology, it is not a distinct branch like behaviorism or psychoanalysis or humanist psychology evolutionary psychology it is a perspective on human nature that psychoanalysis behaviorism humanists they use to describe the instruments that they have so evolutionary psychology it is a um we could say it is um, the software and um, Google Chrome, uh, Opera, Safari, they are the distinct branches of, so they run inside of this program, okay? In evolutionary psychology, guys, it is a very important science today to understand the human mind, because that's why we learned about theory of evolution, because theory of evolution according to evolutionary psychology, influenced what we think, why we think this way, the emotions that we have. And the second thing is, these emotions, these thoughts, the use of our fingers, the necessity to create tools, language, uh, the necessity to live in communities, all of these, they are adaptations to the environment that we live in. This is the second premise. The third one now enters in civilization because now we live in an environment that it is completely different from the evolutionary environment to the evolutionary arena that we live in. That's why we cannot go out eating everyday McDonald's. Otherwise, we will uh, buy our ticket to the other life very fast but it is something that we feel um pleasure to doing that so now we start understanding a little bit where buddhism will enter in this perspective questions so far guys everyone is okay let's continue good part two now we get to humans Fantastic. Guys, here is a list of emotions that they are universal. Um, people from different cultures, from different ages, they present this emotion. So it is, uh, we cannot say that they are culturally influenced. They are something connected with our psychological system. Everyone feels fear, everyone feels anger, everyone feels sadness, everyone feels surprise, everyone feels joy, and everyone feels love. With the exception of sociopaths and psychopaths. Okay, but then this is a topic for other discussion. So uh, these then are the sub-emotions connected with these emotions. Unfortunately, I wanted to have a little vocabulary discussion with you today, but we will not have time to do this. So I, uh, you have two possibilities. Either you take a print of this or you wait because I will send the presentation to the groups so that you will be able to access after. So then let's continue. Emotions. Tell, can you read for us? Emotions. Uh, things that occupy our awareness tend to be judged positively or negatively. 
two, emotions are instruments of the genes to make us act as they want. Three, our genes don't care if we are happy. They are they care about being transmitted to the next next generation. And four, we are trapped in a moral matrix. Excellent. And now I will tell you the reference, the initial reference, right, of the <laughs> matrix. Because, guys, now what I am telling you is your emotions, that uh, something that we consider really connected with us, they are not designed for our well-being. Our emotions are instruments of our genetic characteristics with the objective to be transmitted to the next generation. Yes? So anger. We feel anger against, for example, a rival. A rival that can eliminate our chance of going to the of our genes going to the next generation. Fear a situation that can eliminate the chance of the genes going to the next generation. Love for people that can propitiate this going to the next generation. Joy when we achieved an objective that will guarantee or will increase the probabilities of the genes going to the next generation. And surprise, a surprise perhaps, uh, it can be something that the genes they were not expecting and now they need to adapt. Have you, uh, have you watched the movie The Matrix? I asked this, the hikers, um, yesterday. But if you haven't, please do. Now that you are an adult, fully cognitively well-equipped, and you will see the metaphor that I am using. Uh, in the Matrix, the humans, they live in a fantasy world uh, because the real reality, it is the robots, the machines, controlling them. The analogy that I am doing here is that you are like Neo. You are like Trinity. You are like Morpheus. What an honor, right? <laughs> And then you do like the the things. <laughs> please, guys, do not step on the walls, neither the ceilings, okay? And please do not sh start shooting guns. We are peaceful people here. Um, the, the thing is that the machines are the genes. And they are influencing the reality that we see, guys. Because if we identify, it is like this. When we see things we do not perceive this consciously because that's not the objectives of the genes. But we have a continuum of something good, pleasure, or something bad, pain, uh, or something that we do not want. And we do not decide this. This who decides it is our genetic characteristics. So they create a scenario where we will move in reality, yes? So this is what I call the matrix. We do not see reality objectively because natural selections processes, um, emotions that they are the instruments that the genes manifest, they influence our decisions. When we like a person, we will tend to trust this person more. When we do not like a person, even if this person has um, important ideas or if this person can contribute to our life, we will ignore this person. And this, in a lot of ways, is done subconsciously. Okay? So things that happen be, uh, uh, below our uh, genetic um, our conscious mind. Okay, guys? So far, so good. People, one minute of pause. Okay, one minute of pause. You can brief a little so that we'll continue. I will take water, okay? Because otherwise I will be voiceless in the end of this talk. You can take, I would suggest you guys taking water and apple. This helps the concentration. Uh, an apple a day keeps the doctor away. Be back in one to two minutes.
Okay, guys, if you are back, we can continue. Excellent. Did you take something to eat? Yeah, good. Good. Not at all. I, I need to I need to take a shower actually. <laughs> <laughs> so I will wait. Good, good. I, I I do not think you will have time to do that just now, Tell. Yeah, that's why I, I, I've done nothing. <laughs> so you you just Yeah. <laughs> I'm just concentrate. Excellent. <laughs> The emotions. You, yeah, <laughs> in, emotional and moral matrix that we have. Exactly. All right, all right. Let's see. Elisa, Edu, Mari, Leo. You can see now, guys, that I am prepared. Now, <laughs> as Zagalo would say, vocês vão ter que me engolir. Yeah, now... Okay, Elisa is back, Leo and Edu. Guys, let's continue. Okay, let's continue because we do not have time to lose. Let's move on. Emotions, then, we see that they are a product of natural selection and they are vehicles to our genes. Beautiful. Let's move on. Fantastic. Now, guys, other thing that I will tell you, it is connected with something that it, it has been um, consistently demonstrated that against what behaviorism taught, we are not blank slates. What does it mean blank slate? Blank slate means tabula rasa. So um, a child that is born for a very long time, it was considered as this jar, uh, ready to be filled with what we decided to put. Uh, um, so that people were seen as empty recipients, that society would put liquids into that, the liquids that we decided. This is what behaviorism considered. However, uh, we can see that people have different characteristics. We have personalities, we have political tendencies. So this is something interesting. Political tendencies, usually something that we consider that it is our decision, can be and it is um, biologically influenced. You can see that I'm not saying biologically determined. I am saying that it is biologically influenced. So not blank slate. Um, Edu, please, can you read for us? Uh, our brains are organized in advance of experience. Our mind comes with a first draft that we can expand from on it. One, harm care to fairness, reciprocity, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Golden rule of ethics. In group, loyalty, uh, authority, respect, purity, chastify. Chastity. Chastity. Political right, moralize sex and impurity. Political left, moralize food and authority. Excellent. So we see, guys, that the political right uh, usually has tendencies to moralize sex and impurities, while the political left moralizes food, what you put inside your body, um, uh, what you eat, and authority. So what does it mean? Imagine uh, that these five points, guys, they are like equalizers. That once you are born, they are set to a specific configuration. Yes, so imagine that you are born and then 
in advance of experience, your brain is organized in a way that harm and care, uh, how much attention you pay to that will be in the configuration five or in the configuration 10 or in the configuration two. Fairness and reciprocity, um, depending um, your biological characteristics, it will be um, equalized to number five. And then in your life, what you can do is put maybe one, two up, maybe one, two down, okay? I am using a metaphor. I'm using an analogy to understand this. So the equalizers, they are uh, set in advance of experience um, to a little bit higher, a little bit lower, maybe the other a little bit higher. And as you leave, as you have experiences, this can go a little bit up or it can go a little bit down, but it is organized in advance of experience. And I will tell you how this influences political choice. Okay, so let's move on. Excellent. So what we have, guys, now this is a research that has been conducted uh, in the United States. Uh, here I just put the result in United States, but it has been conducted on uh, different countries of um, Europe, Asia. I took this data from a TED Talks called uh, The Model Roots of Liberals and Conservatives. It's a very interesting TED Talks. I would uh, advise you to put in your um, watching list the model roots. It is this one here. Very, very interesting TED talk. And here I will uh, take a little bit from Jonathan Haidt. Uh, Jonathan Haidt, it is a cognitive psychologist. He's a bestseller author. Uh, talking about, uh, there is a book from him that I really like. It is Happiness. Authentic Happiness, I do not think so. Jonathan Haidt. The Happiness Hypothesis, a very interesting book. And then uh, this TED Talk, I will send you the link so that you can watch after. He presents these findings. And the idea, guys, is um, that um, here he's describing liberals and then the conservatives. Usually liberals, what they have, the equalizer that they have on, remember, um, the configured, organized before of experience. Purity in group and authority, the equalizers of this, they are lower, they are low. As the person become, uh, um, defines himself or herself as moderate, these equalizers start to go up, okay? So people that consider themselves uh, moderates, they have personality characteristics that they pay more attention to things as authority. In group means loyalty and purity. And once we get to the conservatives, we see that things as authority, loyalty, and purity, um, people that would identify themselves as conservatives in personality tests, they would present a higher level uh, on the importance given to authority, to in-group, and to pur purity, while they would have... Um, this <laughs> okay tell question it, it is just a doubt about when you say that the conservative give importance to things like authority is like the importance itself or or like the word like uh, a conservative will will pay attention on higher level on a higher level of authority or the importance like a discussion through the the the, the matter interesting interesting let me see if i can clarify that the conservative uh, the conservative will give more 
importance to the necessity of authority. And the conservative will try to respect more the authority and it will try to create and maintain more the authority. So uh, the hierarchical distribution in a company, the hierarchical distribution in a house, in a family. So people that define themselves as conservatives, they will give more importance to the necessity of authority, the necessity of loyalty, how important it is for you to be loyal to your friends. Liberals, they will say, ah, it's a little bit important. Conservatives, they will say, it's really important. Um, if you ask liberals how important it is to be pure, not to um, um, get yourself influenced with impure things. And impure can be impure ideas, impure people, impure substances. Conservatives will say it's really important that you maintain your purity. Liberals will say, well, it's a little bit important. Okay, not that much. And, and while the liberals will give more importance to this idea of uh, harm and care, so not harming other people, taking care of people, conservatives uh, will say, oh, that is important, but not as important as the liberals say. Okay, guys? Now, let me uh, contextualize this to a study. There is a study called the dog study, that depending the dog that you decide to have, uh, this would determine your political choice, if you would be more liberal or if you would be more conservative. Let's do this experiment right now. I will create an uh, exercise on the shot. Let me see if I can do that. What do you prefer to have? What kind of dog do would you prefer to have? And then I will put two choices there. A loyal and obedient one. A friendly and um, very, um, yeah, friendly and welcoming one answer there guys it depends on the objective of having that dog <laughs> uh, will, it, will it be for safety or will it be for like having a friend that, that's the question tell there is no further explanation <laughs> too difficult you send in chat, Matheus, the, the question? Yes. Take a look if you if you find there, Artus. Maybe it is in the shot. Maybe it is where there is a triangle, a square, circle one. Tem uma... Okay, Artus? I yeah. want to vote both, but I can't. I have some problems when I have to decide between only two options. Yeah. It is too objective. <laughs> Escape the model matrix. Damn. <laughs> God damn. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Uh, excellent. Excellent. Interesting. So what kind of dog would you prefer to have? A loyal and obedient one. Now let's see what this means, guys. Uh, so I would like... I would be more likely to get a dog that was independent-minded and relates to its owner as a friend and equal. So liberals would prefer to have a more um, independent-minded, uh, friendly dog. People that have political liberal choices would have a tendency to answer this question that I've made you as selecting an independent uh, um, and uh, friendly dog. But you see, some conservatives would select that as well. But then the, um, the tendency increases uh, when we say extremely loyal to its home and family and doesn't warm up quickly to strangers. So we see that 
conservatives would answer that they would prefer a more loyal and obedient dog because conservatives pay more attention to things as authority, things as loyalty, yeah, obedience. Okay, so our group has presented conservative tendencies. Okay, guys, what is not good, neither bad. It is a description, yeah? So let's continue. This is to show, guys, that uh, our equalizers determine or influence, it's better, our political decisions. Let's move on. Mm. This is just a little research. I will not get too into that. But it is found, guys, that people have a tendency to stop cooperating if there is no punishment. Okay, so if there is no punishment, 50% of people in the first round will cooperate. In the second round, in the third, in the fourth, in the fifth, in the, in the sixth round, cooperation will go down if there is no punishment. This punishment, guys, can be uh, not a physical one. It can be a moral one. It can be a social one. It can be a financial one. But once you implement punishment in a, uh, in a game, for example, some sort of punishment, you see that each round after that, cooperation gets bigger. This is a study related with people, they would have money, like $50. And then every round you could give $5 to a group cause. Yeah, so 50% of people would give $5 in the first round. In the second, this number would reduce. And then as we would progress, the number would reduce more and more and more. But then the scientist did this. You can give $5 and one more dollar to punish people that did not cooperate. And then, guys, this is the result that they found. Once you can give the $5 to not only you cooperate more, <laughs> you pay more because now you are giving $6. But then you are punishing the people that, and then you are become afraid, oh, I can be punished. So uh, cooperation decays without punishment. That's why, for example, in a society we need laws. Yeah, because... People are not um, altruistic. People are not, um, how we would say, uh, uh, what do we call like Bill Gates, a person that gives money to a lot of uh, philanthropists. Yeah, people are not as philanthropists as they want to believe and as they want other people make them believe. Okay, because it's natural selection. Yeah, we are products of that. Okay, so then research shows. Leo, can you read for us? Yes. Uh, research shows that to solve cooperative problems, it uh, really helps. It's not enough uh, to appeal to people's good mot motives. It helps to have uh, some sort of of punishment. Liberals speak for the weak and the oppressed want change the injustice even at the risk at the risk of trials. Conservative chaos chaos, chaos uh -huh. of risk of chaos. Conservatives speak for institutions and the traditions uh, went to order even at the cost to toes out to the bottom. Excellent, guys. Uh, I would like you to put on your notebook uh, there liberals, and then you, I would like you to put justice. Justice is something really important for liberals. Um, and then you can put this sentence justice even at risk of chaos. This is what a liberal perspective would say. Liberals, column, justice, even at risk of chaos. Pay very close attention to this word, chaos. 
Now you can put there also conservatives, and then you can put institutions and traditions. Order. Okay, guys, so liberal, they, the liberals, they, they speak for the oppressed. They really pay attention on this thing of harm and fairness. Uh, this is not fair. People need to be treated better. Uh, people need to have uh, access to education. People need to have access to school. People need to have access to food, right? Um Conservatives, on the other hand, they, they believe that sometimes you need to break some eggs to make scrambled eggs, to make a homelet. You need to break eggs to make a homelet. So you need to prioritize institutions and traditions, order, and sometimes you need to make sacrifices. Okay, and liberals would say, wait a second, what kind of sacrifice are we talking about? Who will be sacrificed at the cost of what and for whom? Okay, so this is the political debate. Yeah, um, it is important to have order. It is important to have a tradition. It is important to have uh, our institutions. Um, because this will generate a better society. This is a conservative speech. Liberals would say, no, we need to sacrifice a little bit of progress, perhaps, so that people at the bottom of the pyramid have more access to better things, right? So that everyone has a chance. This is fairness. And this is what, for example, a person that has the equalizer of fairness would say. Okay, guys, you see that I'm not saying in any moment that liberals are correct or that uh, conservatives are correct. But you see that this has a tendency to be very well distributed in a society. And this is something interesting to think about. Okay. Oh, now we start getting to the third part, the antidote. Now I think we start getting a little bit more um, philosophical in our class, a little bit less scientific, a little bit more philosophical, because now, guys, we will uh, bring to our discussion different traditions of thought and different... Um, what different civilizations thought about that. You see, guys, that liberals, they prioritize uh, justice. Even if it is necessary, chaos. Uh, conservatives, on the other hand, they prioritize um, institutions, right? Uh, tradition, order. So we have a relationship between chaos and order. Okay, so now let's see what some traditions have to say about that. Oh, that's interesting. Here, guys, what we have, we have uh, the gods Shiva. Shiva means the destroyer. Shiva destroys. Um, and Shiva could be related with change. Yes, with, uh, because if you destroy something, something will be created. So Shiva now bringing this, uh, the Hindus, they didn't do this analogy, but we are doing so that we have a cohesive argument. Uh, Shiva would represent the part of society that wants change. And the part of society that wants change, usually it is the liberals. Okay, and we could even say that natural selection has a little bit of Shiva and a little bit of Vishnu, because natural selection destroys a lot, but natural selection creates. So you see how profound it is this perspective, because 
uh, every process, there is a little bit of order, there is a little bit of chaos, there is a little bit of destruction, and there is a little bit of um, creation. Yes. And then we see that uh, how uh, shallow is our political debate today, because we do not even discuss this idea that perhaps we need to have a well-distributed population that wants change and a well-distributed population that wants order right that wants this stability because if we have just liberals society will be creating very crazily and there will not there won't be structure but then if we have just conservatives in the society society will become very rigid and what happens edu with an animal that doesn't adapt to the environment they die exactly societies die as organisms would die so we need structure and we need creation we need order but we also need um, adaptability yes so returning to the equalizer your personality has a little bit of order and has a little bit of chaos order it is the biological uh, influences that you have Chaos is your life. It is what you will experience. And then you will adjust the equalizer based on that. So it seems that every process has a little bit of chaos and has a little bit of order. And now we get to this perspective there. That's why I love this symbol. And I think this symbol conceptualizes very profound things in a very simplistic manner, in a very um, clear manner. The balance of yin and yang were seen, guys, in uh, Taoism to influence health and order within an individual, society, and the entire universe. Natural selection is a process of the universe, and we are processes of natural selection. And our life, it is the processes, it is the result, perhaps, of our personality and our decisions. So we see, guys, that there is this perspective on yin and yang. Yin is connected with the unknown, things that we are not familiar, change. Chaos, it has the aspect of femininity, and it is night. Yeah, it represents the night in the Taoist perspective. Young, on the other hand, it is the known, what we are familiar, institutions and order. Yeah, uh, and then there is order, masculinity, and it represents on the Taoist perspective, they. So the Taoist, they saw the universe in this interaction between order and chaos, the female forces and the masculine forces, cooperation and competition. And we see that natural selection has a little bit of everything uh, of these characteristics. There is one more thing that I would like to discuss before we continue. Do you remember that in the beginning of our class, I told you about the left hemisphere and the right hemisphere. So, there is an interesting perspective, guys, that, um, and then it, it is still, I, I must be really honest with you on this aspect, it is still unclear, and it wouldn't be correct to say the left part is about the scientist in you, the right uh, hemisphere is the artist in you. Perhaps we could not do this over generalizations, but one thing is for certain. There are some things in your left hemisphere that they are connected with logical thinking, left hemisphere, logical thinking, linear thinking, and language. Your right hemisphere, it is connected with 
new things. It is connected with new stimulus. It is connected uh, with a holistic perspective. Yeah, and while your left brain, it is more analytical. So we see that in your brain, there is yin and yang, there is Shiva and Vishnu, there is order and chaos. Okay, so they are um, uh, profoundly intertwined on that. So maybe this is a, um, as we see, uh, um, there is levels of processes that have this interaction between chaos and order, and this even in our psychology, this, this even in our, in our neuroanatomy. Okay, fine. Can we move on? <laughs> Questions? Luckily, I brought a jar of water here. Huge level of information. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it takes some time to process. <laughs> it takes some time to process. But what I find very pe uh, peculiar, guys, it is how, um, uh, how incredible the narratives that um, old traditions, old religions had to describe things that today we are scientifically discovering to um, this aspect of um, our personality and this distribution. It seems that even uh, natural selection produces a very harm, very harmonical. No, because we know that we are very violent and we make wars like for nothing. But it cre it has a, a distribution on the number of conservatives and uh, the number of liberals in society so that perhaps it potentializes the chance of not only individual but societal progress but this is not a, this is a more a philosophical idea than a scientific fact this is more of uh, of your teacher drifting than something um, a fact right but it's interesting let's continue then Ah, let's watch this video. Balance, guys. Balance. Learn balance with Ana Maria Braga. O segredo na vida é ter equilíbrio. 50% namastê e 50% se fudendo. O segredo na vida é ter equilíbrio. So we see, guys, the importance of balance. Okay? 50% namastê and 50% right so that we, we we lead a more balanced life okay and now guys we get to buddhism are you prepared yeah i i, I believe so right if you have stick up until now it is it is something that you are curious to know very cool guys now we get to this let me contextualize a little Buddhism uh, was um, developed and was taught by Siddhartha Gautama. Um, Siddhartha Gautama was a prince, the son of a king, a prince, um, that he had all the comforts of life. He had good food, he had um, uh, women, he had all, all, all the women in the kingdom that he could desire. He had all the comforts that he could pick up from, and eventually he decided to abandon all of that because he identified that in human existence it existed sickness uh, and it existed death. Yeah, so he identified that there was um a evanescent aspect to existence and he believed that um uh, he fulfilled one of his pleasures but then once he fulfilled one of his pleasures he was uh, unsatisfied with that so he believed he was in a vicious cycle that he would attend the pleasure but then the pleasure would make him simply want more of that. So the more uh, food he had, the more food he wanted. 
uh, the more sex he had, the more sex he wanted. The more um, drink he had, the more drink he wanted. The more objectives he stipulated, the more objectives he wanted. So he identified, well, what am I doing with my life? And then he abandoned the kingdom and he meditated under a tree. So the story goes. So the legend goes. And there, after many days of profound meditation, he achieved enlightenment. Enlightenment, in a Buddhistic perspective, it is a profound clarity about the, ob uh, the objective qualities of existence. So Buddha es escaped the matrix. This is the story. Buddha escaped the matrix because he identified the true reality. And then he returned from this true reality. And then he started teaching. He started talking with people. And then, um, as he was talking with his disciples, right, it sounds familiar perhaps with Jesus Christ, he gave discourses. And the first discourse that Buddha gave was the discourse on the Four Noble Truths. The Four Noble Truths, guys, they are the base of all Buddhist teachings. Yes, so it's where all the other aspects are derived from. But remember, we are not talking about a metaphysical aspect here. We are talking about a very pragmatic one, a secular one without the religious connotations. So the four noble truths. Elisa, what an honor, Elisa, what an honor to read the Four Noble Truths. Oh, okay. The truth of suffering identifies the disease. What is the problem? Diagnosis. I can't get no satisfaction, Mick Jagger. Can you, can you, can you read that singing? <laughs> no, please. <laughs> Unsatisfactoriness. Yeah, unsatisfactoriness. Unsatisfactoriness, okay. The truth of the cause of suffering identifies the reason for the disease. What causes the problem? Etiology. Desire, the craving of pleasure, material goods, and immortality can never be satisfied. As a, re as a result, desiring, desiring then can only bring suffering. Mm -hmm. This then here, guys, was a typo. It is them like as a consequence. Okay. I, I, ignorance, ignorance. Uh -huh. it, it relates to not seeing the world as it actually is. The truth of the end of suffering identifies the likely course for solution. How can we get better prognosis? Understand the imperma impermanences and unsubstantially. Unsubstantially. <laughs> Unsubstantiality. Unsubstantiality of material reality. Readjust our behavior, emotions, thoughts, and perceptions. The truths of the path leading to the end of suffering suggest a remedy. This is how we get better instructions. Buddhism is medicine for our well being. Excellent, guys. So let me explain a little bit. Right? I think <laughs> I think it's relevant there. Guys, by the way, it's 9 p.m. Uh, can we extend our webinar? I believe it will be a more half an hour. Are you okay with that? Unfortunately, I will need to go. Th that's unfortunate. R yeah. Really? <laughs> In the end, in the conclusion. At the, at the, how do I say, at the cherry of the cake. Yeah, so. the cherry of the, now that we will put everything together. Yeah. The video it's will okay. be online, Tell the video will be online. Thank you, and <laughs> see you at the next discussion. <laughs> see you. Thank you for participating. 
everyone will continue no i'm go to to bang bang my my daughter in some minutes <laughs> okay no problem Leo. stick as much as you can but then if you need to leave this is it you can tell us goodbye and then you can leave okay. Thank all, you. Right. all right the rest Artus, Nath, Edu, Elisa, Mari. Mari, are you there? <laughs> I'm here, but I'm freezing. <laughs> take, take a blanket, take a blanket. Leave your camera open. I like to see the reactions that you guys have. It helps me identify, because if you are like this, I know that perhaps you didn't fully understand that. But then if I see that you are like, mm, then I, I think you, you understood. So if you can keep the, you are very stylish, Mari. Don't worry <laughs> about leaving the camera on. Okay? Okay. Excellent. Then, very nice, guys. You are resistant. That's good. That's good. It's a little bit, it's endurance is the name. Let's continue then. The Four Noble Truths of Buddhism, guys, there are four, right? The first one of them, it is the truth of suffering. This suffering, guys, can be translated as, uh, this is Dukkha. Dukkha can be translated as not simply suffering, but unsatisfactoriness. So it, it is this Mick Jagger um, um, described Amazingly, I can't get no satisfaction. So you see that um, Mick Jagger in this sentence described what the, uh, the first truth of suffering means, that we can never get completely satisfied in life. Every single decision, every single moment, every single accomplishment, every single desire attended will never give us complete satisfaction. So this, guys, is the truth. This is the disease that human beings have. And this is now returning to natural selection. This is the objective of natural selection, that we cannot get complete satisfaction. Otherwise, we will pass, we will not pass our genes to the next generation. So you see how clear Buddha perspective was on these um, characteristics that we have. The second thing, guys, is that we are really, uh, this is the reason of the disease. So this is the, uh, the disease, the, this unsatisfaction with life. And now, what causes the unsatisfaction? It is our... There are two things in Buddhist teachings that it is really important to understand. Desire and ignorance. Desire, guys, it is our necessity for material goods, for having uh, food, for having good food, for attending our senses money for example and we also want social esteem yes what people think of us this is a desire yeah if we want to be respected if we want to be loved if we want to be accepted this generates suffering um, and then we also have this necessity of immortality the fear of the termination of life. So this desire for pleasure, for material good, for social esteem, and for immortality, this generates suffering. And immortality, social esteem, pleasure, material goods, they are the objectives of natural selection. So you see, guys, that Buddhism is giving a remedy to natural selection and to the impulses of our genes. 
Buddhism is saying, if you attend to natural selections objectives, fundamentally, you will never be happy. Because it will always be, uh, you will always be unsatisfied. Because remember the three principles. The animal should seek pleasure, but the pleasure should be temporary. It is a design of natural selection. Ignorance. Now we enter to the moral matrix. We enter to the emotions. It relates to not seeing the world as it actually is. So what Buddhism is telling us is that our emotions, this necessity to say, they are wrong, I am right, this is good, this is bad, this is delicious, this is terrible, I have a good idea, I, because we always think that we have the best idea and the other people are stupid. Yeah, it's like, wow, the people are really stupid. And, no, but I am correct. So we have, guys, this very built in. But the moment that we, okay, Leo, uh, and then, Leo, the, the rest of the presentation will be on YouTube so that you can watch there. Um, so then, guys, you see uh, this perspective. Uh, Buddhism, in a way, tells us if you want to see reality objectively, you need to escape the desire for material good, for social respect, for immortality, because this will always make you unsatisfied. And you need to escape the moral matrix. What is the moral matrix? This group is correct, this group is wrong. And then you remember our discussion on Shiva and Vishnu, Ying and Yang. So in a way, Buddhism is telling reality is not good versus evil. I am right versus they are wrong. If we are thinking this way, our thoughts will be distorted. We will not be seeing reality objectively. We will be very connected with what we call tribalism. And tribalism, it is something that natural selection prioritizes. We versus they. Us versus them. My people, usually the correct one, because I am participating, versus the wrong people. The people that took the bad decision. And Buddhist, uh, Buddhist perspective tells us that we simply think this way because we are ignorant on the quality, on the nature of reality. Because reality, it is two opposites interacting all the moment. There is no right or wrong. And how crazy it is to think that Shakespeare said, there is no right nor wrong. Thinking makes it so. Shakespeare described that, and Shakespeare was really Buddhist in this uh, description. And we see, guys, how unnatural for us it is to think, wait a second, I am not right, and the other people are not wrong, so this means that I can be wrong. It, this means that my group can be wrong and that there is no wrong or right. This is what Buddhism is telling us. That if we decide good versus evil, God versus devil, Jesus versus Satan, Flamengo versus Fluminense, Lula versus Bolsonaro, if we get to this type of thinking, we are uh, we will suffer and we will be blind to the nature of reality. Five seconds to let this information sink in <laughs> while I drink a little bit of water too. Write in the, the chat the Shakespeare sentence, uh, please, Matos. Yeah, there is no... Let me see if I can find the quote. Um, 
It is this one, Arthur's. There is nothing either good or bad, but thinking makes it so. You can write on your notebook there, guys, because this also describes the second... Um, it contributes to our second perspective. So what Shakespeare is telling us, guys, is something that many philosophies and really not religions, because religions, some of them usually are very tribalistic, right? And um, but uh, Stoicism, for example, says that in your life, everything is about perspective, problems, opportunities is simply the way that you tell yourself the story, because there is no good or bad. At all. Life simply happens, but you, inside the model matrix, inside the distortions of your genes, you think this is good. It's good not for me. It's good for my genes. It's good to pass my information to the next generation. This is what the reflection is telling us. Uh, that our brains, our bodies, they were influenced by a process that is, in, uh, that is going on for billions of years, yes? So we are, in a way, products, and we are victims of this process. And Buddhism is a rebellion against this. This is the main insight that perhaps we will develop today. Buddhism wants to rebel against natural selection so that you can be happy because it is easy to be angry. It is easy to think all the time. It is easy to be selfish. It is easy to be competitive. It is, to, it is easy to be egotistical. It is difficult because it's not against, because it is, it goes in collision against natural selection's objectives. It is difficult to be altruistic. It is difficult to be cooperative. It is difficult to think in the other and not simply in yourself. It is difficult to be ethical. It is difficult to resist to the temptations of life. But if you can do that, you will have a better life. If you rebel against natural selection, you will have a better life. So what we are doing now, guys, in a way, it is an act of rebellion. Rebellion against a process that it is in duration for billions of years. Ooh, I got a little bit eloquent now, didn't I? Okay, guys, so let me continue. The truth of suffering now, guys, identifies the likely course for solution. So you see that Buddha, Siddhartha Gautama, after he achieved enlightenment, he became Buddha, the Buddha. So he taught us that there is uh, a, a quality of unsatisfactoriness in our life. And he taught us that uh, we will always suffer if we are guided uh, if we are like uh, uh, directed, conducted by desire and by ignorance. But then now there is the truth of the end uh, of suffering. So Buddha, it is a doctor. Buddha is the doctor not for our body, but the doctor for our soul in a way. It is the doctor for our spirit because he identifies that there is a problem he identifies first truth, uh, the first noble truth. He identifies that there is a cause for this problem. Second truth, uh, second noble truth. And he identifies that there is a solution. The third noble truth. The third noble truth of suffering identifies the likely course for solution. Understand that in life there is some quality of 
impermanence, to everything. And there is a unsubstantiality to our pleasures. So that we attend the pleasure and then we go after the other. We attend the pleasure, we go after the other. So we should simply stop this. And we should become a little bit more present. A little bit more mindful. Uh, we should stop thinking about tomorrow so that we simply enjoy this moment because this again is not natural it's difficult to do that is the most difficult thing to do but do, do you know uh holy grail calice sagrado yeah from artus uh, uh, not artus arthur and the uh, knights of the round table that they go after the Holy Grail, and the Holy Grail is the most important thing that a human being can have. And the knights, cavaleiros, they go in the forest, and then they say, go in the place that you are most afraid of, and you will find the Holy Grail in the most obvious place. And the most obvious place, guys, is now. It is this moment. This is the holy grail of well-being. Yeah, and this is really difficult to find. It will not be ah, here it is the holy grail. No, it is a journey that every single day you need to face life, you need to face adversities to find it. So every single day you practice that. It is not something that will fall divinely in your lap, but it is something that will give your life quality and you will not simply be a slave, a slave, okay, slave, escravo, a slave from your ignorance and desires. And we should readjust our behaviors, emotions, thoughts, and perceptions. And then finally, the, the fourth noble truth is the truth leading to the end of suffering. Now, this is the remedy. The, uh, what Buddha will say, guys, I must tell you that I think is really utopic. It's something that I believe um, it's very hard for us to do every single time. But... It is a direction. It is a guideline in how we can do that. The, the fourth noble truth, it is that, uh, that is this remedy. And the remedy, it is this. The, uh, the eightfold path. Edu, please. Right understanding, accurate understanding of the nature of things. <clears throat> right intention, thought. Correct intention, avoiding thoughts of attachment, hatred, and harmful intent. Right speech, refraining from verbal misdeeds, such as lying, divisive speech, harsh speech, and senseless speech. Right action, refrain from physical misdeeds, such as killing, stealing, and sexual misconduct. Right livelihood. Avoiding trades that directly or indirectly harm others, such as selling slaves, weapons, animals for slaughter, intoxicants or poisons. Right effort. Abandoning negative states of mind that have already arisen, preventing negative states that have yet to arise, and sustaining positive states that have already arisen. arisen. A reason. Right mindfulness, awareness of body, feelings, thoughts, and phenomena, the constituents of the existing world. Right concentration, single mindedness. Excellent. This guys is one of the most important precepts of Buddhism of Buddhism. 
monks, they live by these directions, yeah? This is called the Eightfold Path, and this is the direction, this is the instruction that Buddha gives to achieve enlightenment. So, right view, right understanding. This means that we should escape the moral matrix. We should look to reality objectively and not by the distortions of our emotions. Right intention. We should um, create in our mind a garden that we remove bad things and we plant good things. So we remove uh, weed, erva daninha, not marijuana, <laughs> and we should plant flowers or fruits, okay? So right intention, right thoughts. Be very careful with what you think and what kind of thoughts you nurture. Because the thoughts, guys, imagine your mind as a garden. And imagine uh, thoughts of attachment, hatred, like when you, are, you feel, oh, that I hate that person. This is really dangerous. I hate this situation. Uh, or when you think, I want to cause bad things for that person. This is a very dangerous plant to have in your garden. So you should remove it and plant good things there. The first thing that you should identify is that this hatred, anger, it's not necessarily you that decided to have that. It is a product of your genes. It is a product of natural selection. So you should not simply accept that. Right speech. You should um, not lie. You should not say bad things about people. You should not say divisive things about people. This is a good person. This is a bad person. Gossip, for example, we should not do that. Right actions. So we should not act badly. We should not kill. We should not harm people. We should not practice sexual misconduct. Livelihood. So we should construct our life that the way that we live help people and not cause bad things for people. So we should not participate in the destruction of nature. We should not participate in um, things that cause bad things to people. We should not sell weapons. Right effort. So this is connected with eliminating uh, negative states of mind, preventing them from arising. So the ones that are here, eliminate. The ones that want to arise, prevent. And then um, sustain positive things that, positive states of gratitude, of joy, of a love for humanity, a love for yourself. These you should sustain. Right mindfulness, it is what we have been discussing on the hike classes. Be aware of your body, be aware of your emotions, be aware of your thoughts, be aware of your comportments, but be aware, be attentive, not simply accept them. I am feeling angry, I am feeling um, dissatisfied. And then you, sh uh, you shouldn't simply nurture this. You should identify, well, I am feeling this, but can I reduce this, this emotion? Can it be better directed? Can it be better uh, conducted? And right concentration. So achieve a state of single-mindedness. This is um, perhaps, guys, what we consider meditation today in the West is simply this last two here. So meditation in the Occidental world, uh, in a way, eliminated all of this sixth first part and focused on this mindful meditation and then trying to achieve a state that your mind is 
aligned, that you do not have like diversive thoughts all the time, that you get centered and aligned. But we see that the Eightfold Path is a much more complete perspective on that, that meditation is one part of this. Yeah, so you should meditate, you should have the habit of meditation because this gives you the possibility to escape the matrix. This gives you the possibility to see reality a little bit more objectively. This gives you the possibility to be less impulsive and less controlled. So meditation is the moment that Morpheus removes Neo from the matrix. And this is something that we should do every single day, or if not every single day, as frequently as we can, because this will remove a lot of bad things about our existence, such as desire and ignorance. Escaping the matrix. Natalia. Okay, um, natural selection has a malicious sense of humor. It leads us along a series of promises and then keeps saying, just kidding. <laughs> the moral animal, Robert Ring, right? Right. But, but this advises us to rebel against natural selection, identify the tra transit of the material things, train our minds to perceive reality as it is, step our outside the good versus evil battle, be careful with our ego and desires, give more than we, we receive, be grateful. Excellent. So these guys is the general conclusion of the argument, identify that, one, uh, natural selection does not give a shit about objectivity. Natural selection wants that you pass the genes to the next generation. So uh, natural selection does not want you to perceive reality as it is. Natural selection wants you to be very immersed in tribalism, good versus bad. Natural selection wants you to be very connected with your desire and with your self-protection. Natural selection wants you to um, receive more than you give, of course. And natural selection does not um, give an ounce of importance that if you are grateful. Natural selection does not care if you are feeling nice, okay? So... These are some suggestions to escape in the matrix. By the way, guys, if you want to learn more about evolutionary psychology and how uh, evolution and how natural selection influenced our behavior, I suggest you this book, The Moral Animal. It's a very interesting book. Um, it is not necessarily short, but it is a very, very insightful reading that will teach you about uh, political decisions, it will teach you about um, societal influences, it will teach you about Darwinism, what this means and how much this is correct and how much this is wrong. So it is a very, very interesting book, The Moral Animal. Now, guys, we get to the conclusion of our webinar. Buddhism, it is a philosophy. Today we learned Buddhism as a philosophy connected with what we have, what we know about evolution, natural, psycho um, um, natural selection, evolutionary psychology. We learned a little bit how um, in, um, our a priori configuration influence many things in our behavior. We have learned that um, in the universe, there are always two forces interacting, creation versus destruction, order versus chaos, um, traditions versus change, night versus day, 
male and female. We see that there is in the universe this aspect. So we pass it through a scientific uh, description to a more philosophical one, and we get to this cherry of the pie. Buddhism, as we have discussed today, was a philosophical system that it's a very pragmatic one. That it says, be careful with what you tell to yourself, be careful with what you think, be careful with what you feel, practice the habit of not being so dependent on good versus bad. Yeah, and we are in a perfect moment to practice this politically speaking. So be attentive with that. Be attentive with what you say. Be attentive with how you act. So Buddhism, in the way that we discuss it today, it is a system that can help us to be more ethical, how we can concentrate better, and how we can uh, increase our wisdom. Ethics means avoiding non-virtuous actions. Concentration means developing the control of our mind. So this means control the mind and not be controlled by the mind. Wisdom, understanding the nature of reality. Uh, a fool believes that he's always right. A wise man always doubts his own choices. By being more calm, more aware, a nice person morally, someone who has given up envy and greed and hatred and such, who understands that nothing is forever, that grief is the price we are willing to pay for love. So the contrasts, they, uh, grief is luto. So grief is the price we pay to love someone. So if we love, this is the price that we pay because grief is part of that. The, uh, the opposites, they are one in our sense. The opposites complement each other. Okay, so if the sad feeling of grief, it is directly connected with the very positive feeling of love. So we see that they are one in a sense. This life becomes at very least bearable. We stop torturing ourselves and we allow ourselves to enjoy what that is to enjoy. This is it. That was great, thanks. Did you learn all this by, or did you get inspired by a book or you connect everything? I think life. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, wow, it was a lot of things. It was a. Um, I, I must say that I am doing a course called Buddhism and Modern Psychology, mm -hmm. and that course uh, I'm doing on Coursera, and that course kickstarted the inspiration. Um, but then I started um, uh, the, the aspect of um, Ying and Yang, this idea of the right and left hemisphere is something that I have been studying for a while. So I think it is a um, combination of many different elements that I tried my best to be cohesive, right? To be one seamless structure. But in the course, uh, the professor describes uh, how natural selection influenced our thinking and how we are hostages to that and how um, unnatural it is for us to be um, selfless, right? So I think it's an incredibly valid idea. I think today we describe it an idea that uh, object scientifically gives us the necessary tools to understand why our emotions are not reliable, why uh, we should be very careful with what we decide, um, with what we think and what we s say to ourselves and how we can make this situation better. So it was, I think, a remedy for the secular mind, the remedy for the, the mind that perhaps does not believe in the existence of a god or in the existence of uh, a specific destiny in the universe. It gave us tools necessary to grasp um, the um, 
Because, for example, when something really bad happens in the life of people, we usually tend to be, we usually tend to get very sad and depressed and apathic about that. And I think this gives us some tools to understand, well, but this is um, the opposite. This is how life is, right? So this, th that is um, n that is no good nor bad, but thinking make it so. So there is a aspect of uh, Buddhism detaches us a little bit from uh, these necessities. Okay, guys, commentaries, would you like to say something? We have extended a lot. So let's synthesize in one sentence what you have learned. This is a very important moment. So take it seriously. Okay, so many things is not a good answer. And I don't know is not a good answer. I would like you to synthesize in a brief statement something, because we discussed a lot of things that today was memorable or was interesting for you. We will begin with Elisa. Okay. The first thing that came to my mind is like, we, is like, you explain how we could cheat the system of natural selection, like cheating our gene and be, be more in control. But of course, it leads to multiple new questions. Like, if you achieve these things, we will feel joy of life. We will want to continue things, or we, I don't know, so many questions. <laughs> excellent, excellent. The, the, and it is supposed that if you really paid attention, if you really uh, absorbed that, Lisa, this conversation very likely will lead to more <sighs> questions than answers. It will give you a framework to think but it will generate many questions, uh, and that's a very healthy process. Edu? I was impressed uh, with the connection between the biology and psychology and philosophy. Uh, I think it was uh, really interesting to know about this. It's a seed that's been planted in my mind and I uh, will have to, to think about this, but it really struck me, make, made a lot of sense, and thank you. Excellent. Thank you, too. Thank you, too, for participating. Natalia. I think very interesting, and I, I think that I, I learn and I like to know the importance of balance in our lives in in the world like it's uh, every important to do uh, like liberal li liberals and cons conservative people for be a good word and this thing excellent excellent artus last but not least artus <laughs> I really like all the all the, your presentation. Thanks to spend the time uh, mounting this beautiful and uh, very very beautiful presentation to us. But the thinking it's I more likely it's the uh, psychology studies in in in, poli in, in, in political side. Uh, the the graphs you you uh, present you your presentation for us is very interesting and the study this is very hard and it's um, it's really really crazy to think about this because now guys this opens much uh, this opens uh, many questions right it's like and uh, but it's interesting that I also in presented so we also in instrumentalize it with what we how we see human nature today and it's important that you are familiar with that because what we think now about political science what we think about these developments they will be influenced certainly about evolutionary psychology and the theory of evolution so guys 
To conclude, what we discussed today is knowledge. But knowledge, I do not think, is power. I think execution is power. Um, execution is power. Knowledge is potential power. So what we described today, it's, I believe, a, a very robust potential power that will manifest as power once you execute on it. Thank you very much. Have a lovely night. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Bye. Thanks. Bye, guys.